Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we're going to try out a new microphone. Hopefully this one will work this time versus what I've been using before, which has been less than stellar. Today we're going to be discussing the Call of Cthulhu scenario, The Idol of Thoth, written by Joe Trier and published by Stygian Fox in 2017. It's a 1920s-era mystery involving a missing artifact and a race against time. There's also a good potential for action and is suitable for both novice and experienced characters. The scenario is short, coming in at just 21 pages, and it took our group about five hours to complete. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give my criticisms and my suggestions as a game master who has completed this adventure. Hey, and I'm Jack the NPC. I'm going to give this one to you from a player's side of things. Now for this adventure, we dusted off a group of characters that we hadn't played in a while, who coincidentally, their last run was in the scenario Thoth's Dagger, which kind of means that our characters' careers have devolved into just running all over the world and picking up all the crap that Thoth keeps losing. Now, from this moment forward, there will be spoilers. Any players in the audience, if you ever wish to play this scenario, you should stop now, but send your keeper this way to get the inside scoop to see if the Idol of Thoth will be right for your group. But if you keep going, you're going to ruin the surprise. Alrighty, keepers, let's get to work. The Idol of Thoth is a great adventure. However, there are a lot of small issues that you should be aware of and prepare for. The setup for the adventure is that the famed archaeologist Arthur Ormond has returned from Egypt with a small 18-inch high sarcophagus believed to contain the legendary Idol of Thoth, a statue of pure diamond. However, there is no obvious way to even open the sarcophagus. Then, last month, while working in his office, the sarcophagus fell under the light of the full moon and opened on its own, revealing the idol inside. The powerful and sentient artifact tried to seize control of Ramon's mind. However, he fought back, disfiguring himself in the process and landing himself in Arkham Asylum. His family, who evidently didn't feel any need whatsoever to wait on this, immediately sold all of his collection to the Boston Museum of Fine Art, who are now planning to do an exhibit around the collection with the Idol of Thoth as its main centerpiece. However, the night before, while Clarence Butterfield was working in the museum late at night, the light of the full moon came in through the atrium skylight and touched the sarcophagus, opening it up to reveal the idol. It tried to capture Butterfield's mind, and before it did, he struggled against it, knocking over and breaking one of the other artifacts. Hearing the commotion, the curator, Mrs. Ethel Browning, rushed in, and her mind was also seized. Now both under the idol's control, they wish to expose as many people to the idol during tomorrow's gala and bid the big unveiling. The next morning, the museum manager, Mr. Hollister, unlocked the atrium to find one of the artifacts broken and the idol missing. Despite Mrs. Browning's insistence that he not do it, it was then that Mr. Hollister decided to call the player characters. The scenario offers a helpful timeline to keep all of this straight, and while it seems like an obvious thing to do, many modules don't include anything like this, so a huge thanks to Joe Trier and Stygian Fox for putting a timeline and events in to keep everything nice and neat for the keepers to use. The scenario begins as the investigators arrive at the museum. We get a long and overly wordy description of the place, as well as a good picture of the floor plan. Now, the big event for the collection's unveiling is tonight at 5 o'clock. Now, I'm going to assume that's just a big gala with the richest and most influential people in town that are all going to arrive. I would go ahead and add to the scene some workers that might be hanging a big banner above the front door that's announcing the opening of the exhibit tonight. There's also some handouts that the PCs can get, which is informing them all about it. However, there is a typo on the handout that says 7 o'clock instead of 5, so correct that before you give it to your players. Or maybe have Alistair yelling at one of the printers that the flyers are incorrect and the PCs come walking into the museum as he is yelling at this guy about he screwed up and now the flyers all have the wrong time on it and now everything is just going wrong with this big opening. And he tells the PCs that, you know, having the misprinted flyers is the least of his problems and that's why he's called him in. Now the first hurdle that the keepers are going to need to address is why are these characters even involved? Now this is an easy fix if they're private investigators because they're the obvious choice that you would have for something like this. But if they're not private investigators, you need to have a good excuse for why they're even there in the first place. So you can make them friends of Mr. Hollister or just friends of friends and maybe Mr. Hollister has heard of their reputation as good problem solvers. 
For my game, one of the PCs was a private detective, while the other two were affiliated with Miskatonic University and their archaeology department. Why archaeologists and antiquarians would be invited? Well, they're probably the best ones to know who somebody would try to sell a stolen artifact to. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I am a little insulted that you could even imply that the reputable trade of archaeologists would have anything at all to do with people like grave robbers and art thieves and smugglers and fences and... Holy crap, I just described my entire contacts list. Yeah, never mind. Probably a pretty good call on your part. And speaking with Mr. Hollister and Miss Browning yields some good information. But one thing that does seem weird here is that Browning, who is wanting the investigators gone and out of her hair before they could mess anything up, doesn't just come out and say that Professor Gray at Miskatonic University has been really pushing trying to acquire the idol from them and has even sent her some threats. I would pretty much expect her to be all like, oh yeah, it was probably this guy that's up in Arkham, so why don't you run along, go to Arkham, and get out of town because I don't want you here. It's at this point that the Keepers can run into some problems while they're doing this investigation and they need to be prepared. First, have Browning's alibi completely ready for them. When did Butterfield leave? When did she leave? Because she's the one that would have locked the door and was able to verify that everything was fine when she locked the door. The module doesn't give you all the details on this, but you need to have them ready and believable because your player characters are going to be asking a lot of very specific questions, and you don't want them to be able to poke holes in it because you haven't given it enough thought before they start asking you these questions. Next, there are a few issues that I and some of the other reviewers have found about this scene. Question number one. Have you called the police, and if not, why not? Now the answer to that's actually pretty easy. Maybe Hollister has called the police, but the problem is this is going to be a low priority job for them because they got murders and bigger crimes going on. So he's going to hire the PCs, that way this is their number one priority because he is in a rush. Or you can say that he hasn't called the cops at all. Why not? Because this could ruin his reputation and the museum's reputation if word got out that they got robbed on the night before a big event. And this could cost them different people donating money to the museum or loaning their private collections there. Now whichever way you want him to answer that question is completely up to you. But when the player characters ask, have that answer ready. Next, the sarcophagus is standing open, and no one has ever been able to open up the sarcophagus before. So how do they even know that there was an idol inside of it to begin with, and it wasn't just some fantastical myth that inside this box there was going to be a diamond statue? And also, if no one's been able to open up the sarcophagus in thousands of years, how is it they were planning on even displaying the idol tonight anyway? I mean, they hadn't, they hadn't been able to get it open, why would they think they'd have it open by tonight? Well, the first part of this is easy. You can have Mr. Hollister explain that they know that somebody broke into the museum, they know that somebody broke an artifact, and they know that somebody obviously opened up the casket. So the PC's job is just to find out who did those things, and if there was an idol inside and those thieves took it, that's where the PCs are going to find it. Next, you can have Miss Browning tell the PCs that while no one had ever been able to open up the sarcophagus before now, Clarence Butterfield had been working very diligently and he thinks that he thought he had come up with a way to open it by tonight's gala and he had promised that that was everything was right on schedule and he had figured it out. Now of course that is a complete lie and if the PCs had checked the notes that are on Butterfield's desk they're going to find a lot of confirmation that no, he had no idea how to even open this thing. But then you could have Browning cover that up by going, well obviously the thief took the instructions after Butterfield figured it all out, but yeah he totally figured that out, just believe me. Here. Also, one thing's going to happen is the PCs are going to inspect the sarcophagus and they're going to ask you a lot of questions about what sort of mechanism it was that was keeping it shut and possibly how somebody was able to open it. So what I think would be cool to do, instead of just saying it's just got a door that swings open, make it where it's actually got a lot of moving parts that you have to kind of slide and shift in order to open it. A lot like a Japanese puzzle box. And that's why nobody was able to open it up before because this is so complicated and so strange. Oh, a puzzle box! Nothing ominous and scary about these, am I right? A few other things that do need to be addressed. Butterfield's name is sometimes shown as Butterworth. 
No big deal, but just try to be consistent with whichever one you want to use. Next, the module's description of the atrium doesn't match the map of the atrium. The module talks about stairs leading down into it, but I don't see any stairs here, and it says that there's only one door to the room, however I count seven. This is all an easy fix. You can just say that the other six doors are all bolted from the inside, except for this one, which Hollister unlocked that morning to find the idol missing, and that's the only one that wasn't locked from the inside. As the player characters investigate the scenario, there are a lot of clues that they can uncover. However, none of them are really set as handouts, so keepers, you're just going to need to print the pages off that have the sections that you want to use as handouts, then cut those little sections out and offer them up as the players discover them. Now, it's at this point that the PCs are probably going to leave the museum and go check out all the different leads that they found. We get two maps of Boston here, one for the players and the other for the keeper. In order to meet the 5 o'clock deadline, it's likely and warned in the module that your players are probably going to split up in order to cover them all. However, my players never did split up. Now, one area that my players never even considered as one of their leads was going to check out the Boston Globe, but I wanted them to have the newspaper article that was available there, so I went ahead and put the newspaper article in Butterfield's office. So when they were checking Butterfield's office, they were able to find it with a library use because the place was so messy and cluttered, but then they discovered it and they got the clue. Now, since Butterfield is noticeably missing this morning, the investigators can visit his home, which is in a rundown tenant building. For a price, they can learn from the landlady that he isn't there, but that he drives a blue 1917 Abbott Detroit. Yeah, but because that clock was ticking and we didn't want to waste our time driving back and forth across town, we just did what any smart investigator would do here. We called Butterfield's home. Since he lived in a tenant house and personal phone lines really weren't that common back then, it would probably just be a shared line for the entire house. I had the player roll a luck roll. The player succeeded and I had the phone be answered by Butterfield's landlady. With some successful interpersonal roles, they all got the information that they needed from her, including the details about Butterfield's car, and this saved them a ton of time. Now, one interesting thing about the car, the module never mentions more than it just being a blue 1917 Abbott Detroit, but I went ahead and looked them up, and this is what that thing looks like. Pretty cute car. The Abbott Detroit was a high-end luxury car. Now, it is eight years old, arguably, but it's kind of odd that Butterfield, who's now living in this rundown tenant building, would even have a luxury car that's eight years old. I mean, it's like somebody having an eight-year-old Bentley versus an eight-year-old Honda Civic. Now, I'm not saying that you should change the car. Not in the least. I think this is actually leads to some great potential. So what you can let the players do is make an intelligence roll, and if they make the intelligence roll, you can tell them that this is a luxury car of the time. Okay guys, Butterfield is driving an Abbott Detroit, and that tells me one of two things are going on here. Either A, Butterfield used to be rich, but he obviously ain't rich no more. And the thing about rich people, once they're not rich no more, is they are willing to do anything to get rich again. And a nice diamond statue is a good way to make him wealthy once more. Or B, Butterfield was never rich, but he's always wanted to be rich. That's why he's driving around inside a used luxury car, you know, make himself feel like he's more than he is. And a diamond statue is a good way of helping him achieve that dream that he's always wanted. Either way you look at it, Butterfield was the one that was trying to get into the sarcophagus. The sarcophagus is now open, and Butterfield and the statue are all missing. All this adds up to me that Butterfield is definitely our guy. Now, since my players still hadn't left the museum at this point in the investigation, they went ahead and checked the museum parking lot and very quickly found Butterfield's empty car. So they searched it, and I was cluttered, but I went ahead and added one small thing to it, and that was a 38 revolver that was hidden under the seat. That was no big deal because this is the 1920s, and you can pick up a 38 revolver at the hardware store. Okay, guys, Butterfield's car is still in the parking lot, and that means he probably never even left the museum last night. We need to search the museum! Now, Butterfield is there, but he's hiding in the basement. And while the PCs might find some clues during their search of the museum that there was somebody that's down in the basement, or maybe they hear running footsteps going on kind of around a corner, but they never get more than kind of a moment's glance of who's trying to get away, or maybe you could have them enter a room and then somebody comes up from behind and locks the door behind them, and now they're trapped in the basement and they have to figure out how to get out. But it's very important that keepers not let the player characters catch Butterfield here, because he 
he's going to be important later on in the adventure. But there are a few suggestions in the module, different ways that Butterfield can screw with them, which is kind of fun, and I like that they added those in there. Now, one avenue of investigation that the module does not account for was Ormond's butler, Mr. Henry Rose. The newspaper article says that he was discovered by his butler, and my players wanted to go ahead and interview him and ask them about that night. Now, the Keeper can either have the PCs speak with Mr. Rhodes, and they might have to write everything out that Rhodes' story is going to be about, but if the Keepers don't want to have that much time spent on it, they don't want the PCs running off and kind of chasing that red herring because they do have the 5 o'clock deadline, all you can simply say is that the butler was retained by the family, and after the family got all the money from selling the, uh, Ormond's collection to the museum, they decided to go on an extended European vacation and took the butler with them. So the butler just isn't in the country, and sure, yeah, he could talk to him and they could interview him, but that's going to be long after the 5 o'clock deadline tonight, which means he's got a great excuse for not being there, but he's not going to be used in this adventure. Once all the local leads around Boston are spin up, the next leads are going to take them to Arkham, which is over two hours away. And the first one that they're probably going to start with is Dr. Gray at Miskatonic University. Now, Dr. Gray is homesick, but the investigators can either sweet-talk their way in or break into Dr. Gray's office, which we get a great match for. This is also going to lead them to several more clues. Now that's all cool and everything, but we just skipped doing all that stuff. How do you ask? Well, because the clock was ticking and we didn't want to waste our day driving two hours up there and driving two hours back once we were done. We just did what any investigator would do. We called him on the telephone. With several good interpersonal skill roles, and being that two of our PCs had ties to Miskatonic University, they were able to learn from the staff that Dr. Gray was out that day. Now, they weren't able to get his address and phone number, so they just called the Arkham operator in order to get that. Unfortunately, Dr. Gray's house couldn't be reached because winter storms had conveniently knocked out the phone lines, meaning that the PCs would have to go there if they wanted to talk to him. My players then tried to call Arkham Asylum, where Dr. Ormond was committed. But a failed luck roll meant that the phone lines were out there as well, and with no other choice, my players finally left the museum and decided to drive up to Arkham. Now, we get a great map of Arkham Asylum, which is awesome, because Keepers can then continue to use this map in their campaigns, because Arkham Asylum is a regular place, and if their campaign is set in Arkham, then Arkham Asylum is probably a likely place they'll be visiting a few times. Ah, Arkham Asylum! Now this place brings back some memories. Mostly crying and screaming, a gentle voice telling me that everything is going to be alright. It's kind of nice to be a visitor here for once. Inside the asylum, they'll encounter Dr. Merrick, who may or may not allow the PCs to speak with his patient. If not, there's a great option for the PCs to still get access as a backup, so that way keepers, if they fail their roles, they can still get in there just through a different means. But if either way they do it, eventually they're going to meet Ormond in his cell. Now, the module does give a few alternate ways that this meeting could begin, uh, ranging from the creepy Dr. Hannibal Lecter, you know, kind of standing there waiting for them, to an escaped uh, insane asylum inmate that the PCs have to chase down. So the keeper just gets to decide which which version they want to do, depending on their group and how their game works and everything like that. And I really do like that customization that they're offering in the module. Now, once they do finally get a chance to talk to him, if they had to chase him down, they're going to find out that he is mostly incoherent. He's just raving something about the moon looking at him. Now, it is possible that the PCs might skip the Arkham visit entirely. Uh, that's no big deal. They might elect to go to Dr. Gray's house first. And once they go to Dr. Gray's house, they're probably going to be rushing on to the next portion the adventure and never get a chance to visit Arkham Asylum, but once they are on their way to Dr. Gray's house, it mentioned that it's raining. But before they go to Arkham, mention to the PCs as they're leaving Boston that they're kind of driving under heavier and heavier cloud cover. And the reason for that is if it's going to be raining in Arkham, it still needs to be clear skies over Boston by 5 o'clock that night. That way the moon can go ahead and show through the clear skies and keep the adventure going. So just go ahead and mention that as like, well, it's clear skies over Boston and it's dark over here. Or maybe mention once they leave Dr. Gray's house that all the clouds are kind of thinning out and it looks like they're going to be driving out of the cloud cover on their way to Boston. Now the module mentions this scenario dead light as they're doing their drive to Dr. Gray's. Now other than the fact that both of these just take place outside of Arkham and both of them take place in the rain, I can't figure out what the relation between the two of them is. I think that's really the only connection, but it did confuse me. 
Now, during this drive to Dr. Gray's, Butterfield is going to follow them. Now, the PCs might notice his car tailing him. Now, the module assumes that the PCs are then going to try to lose this pursuer that they realize is following him, and that's going to lead to a big chase. Holy crap, guys, we are definitely being followed right now, and I bet it's our culprit. This means we can either A, speed up and try to get away and never find out who our villain is, or B, we can slow down and catch us a bad guy. Now, my players just slowed their car down because they wanted to get a good look at who was following them because that was their most likely suspect for whoever the thief was. Now, of course, they were able to recognize Butterfield's car as it pulled up, and then they recognized the 38 revolver coming out of the window, the one that I had given them. That's actually not in the module. But this all led to a fun chase and a fun combat, and the PCs eventually drove Butterfield's car off the road, and before they managed to subdue him, he really injured one of the PCs, so it was a nice little thrill there. Now, if the player characters are driving to the house and they don't see Butterfield's car following him, the module gives a few options of what Butterfield might do, especially if he arrives at Dr. Gray's house and none of them are outside protecting his cars, which means he's probably going to sabotage them and wait outside an ambush, and that's kind of a nice little thing to do. However, if the PCs see the car, I don't understand why the module thinks that the players would just automatically try to run from whoever is most likely the thief. Now, once the PCs do get to Gray's house, they're going to be brought inside before the ill professor. He will reveal to them what the idol really is. And if your player skipped going to Miskatonic's library or missed the information there, if they tried to go to the library and search it, but they all failed their roles, you can go ahead and give it to them there. That way, the players can still get the information through a secondary means. Now, Dr. Gray is going to tell the investigators that the idol is a malevolent artifact that only appears under the light of the full moon. Anyone seeing the idol falls under its spell and will do anything to protect it and bring others to it to fall under its spell as well. Now at 5 o'clock, when the museum displays the sarcophagus under the atrium skylight, falling under the light of the full moon, the idol is going to appear inside the sarcophagus and imprison the minds of all the guests, and the PCs need to get back to Boston and stop it. Now this turns the adventure into a desperate race against time. Now the player characters have already should have already been concerned by the 5 o'clock deadline that they were given by the museum, but now it's a life or death situation, so that suddenly becomes much, much more important to them. Now, Keepers, I strongly recommend that during the course of running this adventure, you regularly tell the players how much time they're using as they do every single thing. And that way, they're constantly aware of what time it is and make sure that they understand it was a two-hour drive to get back from uh, Arkham to Boston. Now, even simple things in this game, such as making a telephone call, those can take a while, so try to keep into account every single thing that the player characters do. Remember, at that time, you couldn't just call a number directly like you do today. You had to call a switchboard operator who then you had to answer the line and manually connect you in order to complete your call. That didn't add much time, but it did add a little bit of time, and it would add a lot more time if you're trying to call a place that's like two hours away, because now you have to go through multiple switchboards in order to connect the call. So while it doesn't add an incredible amount of time to your phone call, maybe five, ten minutes a call, all those little five and ten minute increments, they do add up. Now, speaking of telephone calls, if the investigators uh, try to get to a phone and they're able to call the Boston Museum and warn them that they shouldn't display the idol, have them reach Mrs. Browning. Now, the fact that she's under the idol's control, she, of course, is going to say, oh, yeah, we definitely won't show them the idol, you know, thank you for your warning, and she's going to assure them that that's okay and that they don't need a rush. Now, depending on when the PCs do arrive at the museum, is going to give you one of two sort of ends for the entire scenario. If the PCs arrive after 5 o'clock, the gala has started, and all the guests are now underneath the idol's control. However the PCs get through this is going to depend on them. If they try to fight their way in in order to destroy the statue, they're going to have to make their way past 20 guests who are all willing to die in order to protect the Idol of Thoth. This could easily make for a deadly fight, so hopefully your players are going to come up with something a little bit more creative than just trying to charge in there heedless of the danger. Now, the other option is that the PCs manage to arrive before 5 o'clock, which is what my player characters did. When they do and they try to explain to Mrs. Browning, she's going to tell them to come with her because, you know, she has to go ahead and speak with her boss in order not to present the idol because that was going to be the centerpiece. And she's going to lead them off through the museum, and then she's going to open up a closet door, pull out a small pistol, and tell them to get inside. Now, her plan is, is that once the PCs are locked away, she can then, you know, get 20 people under her control, and then she can have those people come back and they can deal with the PCs at that time. And of course, we were going to have none of that, so we fought back. 
Now this is when Seth Dice decided to screw us, because Browning pulled off an impaling strike against one player character, knocking them out, and then shot a second player character who was already injured from before, and now that PC was unconscious. So the third player character managed to take Browning out, and then with only moments to spare before people came rushing in to find out what all the commotion and the gunshots were about, that player character rushed into the atrium, grabbed the casket, and successfully hid it somewhere inside the museum. Now the module says that if the scenario ends with the idol visibly destroyed or any of the guests injured, then all this is going to come down very hard on the player characters, possibly having them arrested for different charges such as, you know, destruction of private property or even murder. However, with our group, they were able to prove that Mrs. Browning pulled a gun on them and actually hurt some of them, and that Mr. Butterfield attacked them on the road outside of Arkham, so they were able to show that it wasn't them and maybe the missing idol was their fault because it was some sort of conspiracy. Now they did manage to avoid jail through getting that uh, story out there, however the player characters still took a serious damage to their credit rating because they were involved in a high profile incident that left their employer dead and a valuable artifact missing, and it was also at the gala right before it opened, which means all the most influential in people in town you know, saw this as the police came rushing in. Finally, once that whole affair had blown over, we managed to get back inside that museum, get the cast that we hid in there and sneak it back out and dispose of it right. So yeah, this adventure did cost us a little bit of money and it cost each of us five points of credit, but hey, we won. Overall, we really did enjoy this adventure. However, there are those areas that a keeper is going to need to work on beforehand in order to keep the adventure running smooth. Have Browning's alibi ready and airtight. Have plenty of details ready to go, that way all everything's consistent, it doesn't sound like she's lying at all. The museum map doesn't match the module description, so just decide on whether you want to go with the description that's in the module text or with the one that's on the map, and just go with that and stay consistent to it. Address the misprint on the flyers, either correct it before the players ever see it, or just work it into the game and incorporate it, maybe have a little fun there. Choose to call Butterfield either Butterfield or Butterworth and stick to it. Expect the PCs not to flee the car on the way to Dr. Gray's home if they do manage to see it. And of course, all the smaller suggestions that I gave about uh, having them do something unexpected like use the telephones or maybe trying to contact the butler. Now another area in the module that just seems weird to me is that during two places, the investigators can receive a plus 10 bonus to their roles if their skills are below 70. Now, one of the things that I love about Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition is that there are no plus or minus bonifiers. It's simply a bonus or a penalty die. So having a plus 10 here really feels like more of a throwback to earlier editions. I just give it a bonus die and even ignore the part where it says if their skill is below 70, I just say it's a straight bonus die and anyone that uses these different things can get the bonus die and that's it. Now lastly, and this is where I'm getting really, really nitpicky here, is that one part mentions insight roles. There is no insight skill in Call of Cthulhu. The module means the psychology skill, but I wanted to point this out in case any new keepers out there see this and they might get confused by it. Now all the things that I mentioned in this module are actually pretty minor and they're really easy to remedy beforehand as long as a keeper's knowing what to do and what to expect before they get started. Now once you do, you're left with a really fun scenario. You can find the Idol of Thoth and drive through RPG for about four bucks. I suggest you give it a look. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please drop us a like. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or game master tips, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, players. You have a great day. You know, the guys and I got a bet over which of Thoth's artifacts we're going to go after next. Personally, I'm hoping it's going to be a crown, but I'm just going to tell you that if it's something like the bedpan of Thoth, I'm going to miss that game.